Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Tonic Accord podcast. We're going to be talking about space today. We're talking to be talking about you know, the politics of space. Um, what what have we seen in the past with how you know different political entities or not have dealt with space, and moving forward is how we're seeing that change in the future. And like, what does that mean for space? Kind of a big open ended thing, but I'm super excited because there's a lot to talk about space, uh, whether it be you know, privatization uh, with SpaceX, um, a second. Space Age. Well, we'll 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 discuss it more in detail uh, in this episode of the Tonic Accord. Alex, um, you just said it. You you were mentioning a little bit before the uh, episode. You wanted to ride in Tesla's uh, or not Tesla, uh, Elon Musk's rocket. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Why do you want to do that? Well, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's more because <laughs> it's been a crazy couple of years. And to be honest, like, I can't leave the house, but I'd, I'd be down to take a rocket somewhere. Fuck it. Excuse my language. But uh, <laughs> but in, in a broader sense, I'm kind of excited that I, I think for the first time since sort of the beginning of the Cold War, you could say kind of the beginnings of the Cold War, there's really a kind of lens on space. Like, people are finally realizing the true ramifications of complete space dominance. And that's either good or bad. We'll probably get into that. But, you know, space is kind of this, well, one of the final frontiers, and it really fascinates me. But what I would say, what I would say off the bat is that space is the final frontier, but it also could be the final nightmare in terms of logistics, you know, in terms of how we deal with it. And I'll I'll stop this, but I just wanted to say really quick, is that I think we're going to need to have a new global treaty or discussion about space because kind of the big driver right now is the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which was signed by the U.S. and the Soviet Union, basically saying that space was going to be used for peaceful means. But now we have, let me see, 110 countries are signed to it. But the details haven't changed much since 1967. And so I I do think we maybe need to have another conversation with other countries because so many nations have space abilities now. Yes. Yes. That's a... That's a good way to bring this off. So let's let's get to that point. Let's like break it down. How do we get to that point where we need something like that? Um, you know, space, the idea of space and exploring it has only been around. I mean, obviously, astronomers have studied space, right? But the idea of humans interacting with space itself and, and gaining knowledge out in space has only been around for less than 100 years. And so when we... You know, we kind of grew up learning about space in the context of the Cold War and the space race between the United States and Russia. And it's important to recognize that that is the biggest driver and was the biggest driver of space innovation, was like national pride and competition with a, with an enemy. Um, and so, you know, the whole race to the moon was, you know, Kennedy trying to push us to the moon before the Russians did. And then we got there. And then once we won, <laughs> a lot of space exploration kind of slowed down. In fact, you know, it's been 50 something years since someone set foot on the moon. Um, only other countries like China mm-hmm. have sent rovers to the moon, but no other, you know, only Americans have stepped foot on the moon and have not again for decades. So why all the slowdown? Well, I thought we were going to exponentially go, you know, we should be at Mars and Venus by now with our flying cars. Well, it's because I think there's a big tie to militarization and you know, fighting an enemy. And after the Cold War died down and Russia was not a threat and they, their space program, you know, you know they, had, they had no money for a space program in the last part of the, of the Soviet Union. There wasn't much incentive to push for space. Um, and I think that's just a really interesting and important idea that our innovation in space has been inherently tied to militaristic or at least adversarial um what's the word um incentives incentives there you are yeah yeah no i i definitely agree with that i I definitely agree with that you know we're too busy now storming the capital and fighting each other and i think i think it's all related that after the cold war in everything we've kind of got complacent and stagnant you know and i remember i was probably a year ago uh, neil degrasse tyson was on joe rogan and he was talking about just all of the things that came out of the space race in terms of technology, military technology that eventually trickled down into our daily lives, stuff right. like microwaves, Teflon, you know, just, just so many little things. And it really does seem like competition and the threat of violence does drive us. 
And it does seem that we kind of stopped caring. Obviously, there's other issues. The world's kind of in flames if you guys have been off the grid for the last year and a half or so. But I, it does seem like space has kind of become this dreamy idea. And now sociologically speaking, or I guess even psychology speaking, like I, I do wonder if there's a bit of kind of we, we like the unknown, but we also fear the unknown. And do we really want to know what's out there in terms of the average person? Like, it's kind of nice to still have this final frontier, but anyways, but, but yeah, like I, I, I agree with you. And, you know, I, I, I like remember watching space force <laughs> back in the spring, not that great of a show for the, for the cast, but there's a part where the Chinese basically claim the moon and just, you know, take out the, the American satellite and just claim the moon. And that actually kind of made me wonder now that we are seeing, especially Chinese involvement up there, what is next? You know, because we do need to kind of relook at the rules, at how to do it. But also, then there's just the the reality of it's going to be hard to get flying cars or just cities on Mars or on any other planet because we don't have the technology that's in movies. And I think part of the problem is there's a bit of pessimism almost, where a lot of people kind of expected we'd be living on the moon by now. And science and science fiction movies doesn't always match up to the actual day to day science on the ground. Right. And I feel like a lot of people just say, ah, we're never going to get there anyways. But luckily we have dreamers. Like I am no proponent of the Chinese government, but I do think that they are very driven, especially in the tech and science world. And in some ways, maybe that'll force the U S to get our toes back. You know, I, I think, I think the future is there for so many reasons, but one that is altruistic would be just better Wi-Fi, better cell phone service, better intelligence, better communications. Like there are some tangible things that we could all agree on, but I would think that maybe it's good that China is somewhat of an adversary who wants to beat us out of the space race again, because maybe we're all going to start fighting for it again. Yeah, that's a good point. So I think the incentives are back, right? I think when I was talking about like the, the incentives of this of the Cold War and the Soviet Union era died out for a while. I think after one, the Soviet Union fell. We didn't really have any competition, so our, uh, we didn't feel as driven. Two, you had multiple shuttle disasters. So I think a lot of public opinion was even like, man, like I watched teachers get blown up live, and we spent billions of dollars on this. Like, is this something we should be doing at all? And so, you know, you saw a massive decline in the funding for NASA for decades, um, especially in the mid-2000s. Um, and so, like, but things have changed again. I think the incentives are coming back. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One is there is – it's more and more commercially viable and financially viable to space travel. So – for a long time, for those that don't know, if you when you used a rocket to go out into space, you everything you used to propel you up, you had to just get rid of after. When you when you used up that fuel canister, you dumped it. That's when you see like the rocket breaking off when you're watching it launch. For the longest time, those fuel boosters, that's millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars down the drain. You're done with that. It's it drops into the ocean, it's scrap, it's junk. But through innovations from a private company like SpaceX, they've made a reusable rocket so that you could go up and then also land the rocket back down and then refuel it, make a few adjustments, and use it again. That allows for a much, much cheaper space travel um, to orbit and back uh, than we've seen before. Uh, I think on top of that, the realization of the information age and the importance of um, using low orbit satellites has also given a new life into space exploration. Um, you know, because because of like you said, like things like Wi-Fi around the world, uh, companies like Facebook wants to give in, used to want to give internet to everyone using satellites, uh, and of course military implications. I was again Neil deGrasse Tyson was on a show explaining how there there was this long-standing you know combination of space science and militarization, and it's not a new concept. Another one he said was the Gulf War. One of the reasons that the United States was so effective in the early 90s against the Iraqi military in the in the Gulf War was because we knew everywhere they were moving at any point and at any time using satellite technology. And that sounds like something normal that we're used to from spy movies now. But in 1991, that was revolutionary. That we, we literally knew second to second when Iraqi tanks were moving in what way. And we were able to combat them with our own very effectively. Um, so 
that that idea of like yeah we're not talking about space travel but th- those satellites are in orbit that's space technology giving our military the information it needed to be effective so that kind of thing i think that information age on top of uh private companies now getting into the game and making it from f- uh find more financially viable to space travel is kind of reinvigorating this this <clears throat> another space era absolutely and and you you kind of triggered a thought in my brain talking about that is i i think that's the true benefit well depending who you are that the true benefit of having better space dominance dominance is probably not a good better space supremacy that doesn't sound good either but whatever <laughs> but but capabilities but are the it, best space there we go <laughs> capabilities yes yes i like that much more but but exactly like there's not going to be, at least as of now, and probably never, based on just my limited view of physics and understanding of how that would work. There's never going to be a Star Wars battle blowing up a, no, 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 you know, blowing up the Death Star. But it's more about on the ground who has better surveillance, and the countries that have better space satellites, better space surveillance, are going to do better. And you know, it's it's actually interesting, kind of on a U.S. politics side of this. Uh, it was actually Obama and Trump who actually understood this better than anyone. Now, I don't know who Trump was getting his information from. But uh, for Trump's defense, it was actually these two kind of piggybacking off of each other because the, the Obama administration recognized the importance of private commercial actors for space. Yes. And I, and I think that's been really crucial because these partnerships, and when I say private actors, it's not like Elon Musk is doing everything on his own. He is still working hand in hand with the U.S. government. But then it was also the Trump administration's emphasis on military and economic dimensions of space exploration, which, which are also crucial. And there was that kind of MAGA America first idea that's like, we're going to create a space force. And I think everyone laughed it off. But in the long term, it was probably a good idea. Even if you don't like Trump, you could agree with some things he's done. And I think that was one of them. And so we, we are in an interesting period where it's almost like, though, the question I have is, like, is it really worth sending people to space? Because, like, I think that was kind of a big thing for its time. But, like, I don't really know if we need to be sending people to space. It's more about better technology in space and who controls what domains. You know what I mean? I guess I mean, I mean definitely who controls the information going around space, right? And, and, and surveillance is huge. I think there are a couple things that may seem sci-fi but that could actually be very big incentive to have like boots on the ground so to speak one is um like asteroid mining uh you know again this is something that you know used to be in sci-fi novels in the early 1900s and now it's something that's actually like legitimate uh japan i believe has been able to put a rover on an asteroid like a moving asteroid which is crazy i think nasa just did that last year um, and so obviously that's the preliminary just kind of feeling it out, but it's not totally unreasonable to think that if a private company could afford to send some kind of mining equipment onto an asteroid, I mean, there's the potential that asteroids could have, you know, uranium, gold, who knows all sorts of minerals and, 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 and metals that could be very value, val- valuable. I mean, I, I've even heard that, like, there's some asteroids they think that have enough gold to basically crash our gold economy, right? <laughs> like, gold would be worthless, like, you know like nothing like a plastic spoon because it's so available but uh i don't think that's gonna happen um even if something did like that did happen i think there would i think there would be some financial mechanisms to prevent like a major shock to our market but even then but the idea though that like a company could actually mine an asteroid in the future i don't think it's too too outlandish um and that's that will then I think come with a lot of policy implications of okay well then is there mining rights like do we give mining rights to certain asteroids to certain companies is it a free for all so you know things that like might seem outlandish now or seemed outlandish a fifty years ago are really not uh, another incentive it is is like I mean I, again I don't think we're gonna have like Star Wars laser battles in in the sky but you know the ability to you know affect someone's power grid using space, um, use whatever kind of space, like real, real concerns. Uh, I, I did think there's an interesting effect though, as far as like potential for conflict, like where could we see conflict? Like you think of, oh, there's so much space in space. Like why would we even rub, rub against each other? Like what the, what's the conflict? Shouldn't there be enough asteroids for everyone? Quote unquote. So one of the problems is what's called the Kessler syndrome. I was looking into this and it's basically, um, 
uh, Donald J. Kessler in 1978 says it is a theoretical scenario in which the density of objects in low Earth orbit, right, which is where satellites are, due to space pollution is high enough that collisions between objects could cause a cascade in which each collision generates space debris that increases the likelihood of further collisions. So it's it's not unfathomable that we literally just have so many satellites that – like you're just going to literally have problems where China breaks one of their satellites with a, a solar panel and that solar panel flies into an Indian satellite, which breaks their satellite, which rams into a U.S. one. And now you have three countries with their best satellites out of business. Like I actually can see that happening. And, and, and that's that's based off of something a NASA scientist proposed. Yeah. OK. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things you said there. First, I'm I'm thinking Ridley Scott alien. What? 1979. Same, like, it's true. Like, you know, it was this sci-fi idea of mining ice for fresh water, mining gold, mining plutonium, whatever it may be. Decades ago, that sounded nuts, but I, I think you're right. Like, more when I said, do we need to send people anymore? I'm like, we don't need boots on the moon. Like, who gives a crap anymore? You know what I mean? But I, like, yeah, we've been there, done that. Like, there's literally no tangible benefit for us putting people on the moon again. Right, we don't, but, need, we don't need another flag. No, we don't. We, we, unless it's a MAGA flag. Just kidding. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, like I, I totally agree with you. I think there's some serious positives, especially because a lot of people will tell you that in the future there's going to be a freshwater crisis. Mm -hmm. And some of these comets and asteroids have frozen ice on them that probably could help with that. So I, I totally agree with you. But that's where the question comes to me is how do we divide up these resources and deal with them? Because of what you're saying with the Kessler syndrome is that it could actually be the best thing that's happened to humanity, in my opinion, is that maybe this is the time where we do become a globalized world because you can't fire on each other up there because everyone's going to die if you do. You can't blow up shit because everyone's going to die up there if you do. Yeah. Maybe it's time we realize that <laughs> the earth is freaking tiny and there's a lot of stuff out here that can help all of us. So I'm going to be for once Captain optimistic here and just say that yeah like maybe when we realize we actually can't attack each other there's some benefits to that but again now on the ground back on earth i think it's going to be complicated because i i uh, copy and pasted a little excerpt from that article one of the outer space treaty from 1967 and it basically declares that in quotes outer space shall be free for exploration and shall be used by all states without discrimination of any kind and then later it goes on, let me see. It also says that exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries. That's great. But that was also an agreement between the Soviet Union and the United States. And now we have about 110, I, I believe it was 110 countries that also have space programs. Right. So, And they also have diverging interests, diverging needs. Some are nefarious actors, some are allies. So that gets interesting to me because they can't really blow each other up in space. So how do we deal with this? You know, because it, it really is complicated. Like, I don't really know how you deal with that when basically it's saying everyone has a right to access these materials and space is a peace zone. But w we know human beings, Drew. I don't know how that comes out, you know? Right. How long does that last? Or do, do private companies also abide by that, that, that agreement? Right, because that was, that was made in a time where the thought of a private company having a space rocket was unfathomable. It was only the big powers, the big dogs of of global power. But now it's like, dude, there's like Jeff Bezos has got a space company. The the Richard <laughs> Branson's got a space company. Elon Musk. It's like a cool. It's like a cool hip billionaire thing to have a space company. So that's <laughs> that's another thing that I don't think that you could have predicted in the 1960s. You could not have predicted that Elon Musk shooting his own personal Tesla with a mannequin in it for fun. Like, how do you predict something like that? So I do think that, though, that that being said, is cooperation with these private companies has proven to be a big driver of innovation in space, and I think it should be continued. Uh, I think the competition between the companies for government contracts uh, you know, is a good thing. That drives them to be more efficient, more financially viable. That's why NASA now uses Tesla rockets to go back and forth to the space station, because I saw that be, we, we stopped our own shuttle program in like 2011, so for about seven or so years, we had to rent 
space on Russian rockets to get our, our <laughs> astronauts to the space station. I mean, what the hell? I thought we were the top dogs. I thought we were the best. We got to buy a Russian taxi up to space. So I'm very glad that they're now back with uh, uh, SpaceX, which is, you know, obviously Elon Musk is South African, but an American company. Um, like, I think that's a good thing. And I think using those, those that competitive market aspect of space now, which was not around in the 60s, will be a good driver of innovation. But I do also think that because you're act, you're now – dealing with private companies that kind of have their own set of rules outside of nations. Uh, we, we need to adopt what you said, like a business ethic or a political ethic, like we did in the past and update it to today's uh, scenarios. Exactly. Exactly. No. And <laughs> it's, it's funny. You mentioned the U S was using basically Russian platforms to, to basically, you know, conduct our space programs. It's, it's funny you say that because yeah, there's a, there's a show I watched, dark tourism comedy travel show on netflix but the guy goes to kazakhstan one of the biggest bases during the soviet era is there for space space operations and the u.s still launches rockets from there right. and, <laughs> and and it's kind of weird russian base inside of kazakhstan with u.s rockets okay that's just and i do think that nasa whether it's internal or because the government never wants to give them the money they need they've become a bureaucratic nightmare and so it it was nice to see this private public partnership. Like, there's some cool stuff going on. There's some really cool stuff going on. Um, and and I I do think that this really does open up the opportunities for us. But again, we need to figure out how to do it because there's Indian billionaires out there. There's Chinese billionaires out there. There's Russian oligarchs who I would argue Russia probably is not going to be doing too much in terms of like new innovations, but call me controversial. I don't care. But, but yeah, I like India, China, Russia really fascinate me with this, but they all have overlapping interests, but they can't do much up there. (laughs) So, so yeah, it's, it's really going to be interesting, but I, I agree with you that, I yeah, think go ahead. I, I was just saying like, they, they can't do much on the moon, right? Like I don't care if China puts right. a flag on the moon, whatever. We we got there first, you know, second's best loser. But uh, I do I do worry about like the the surveillance, like all the satellite junk, all that all that low Earth orbit stuff is very real. That's very affecting our day to day life, right? Uh, that you know on five G networks and tracking military movements, right? That that's the real stuff that. You know, we might say we might all patty cake and say we're using space for the benefit of mankind. But if the U.S. is using it for drone strikes and China's using it to monitor hmm. Uyghur Muslim movement, like that's not for the benefit of mankind. No, not at all. And 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 that that makes me think. Okay, so yeah, obviously we're not gonna you know blow up the moon because the Chinese put a flag on it because right. we have a flag and you know blah blah blah. But could this? Could this, let's just think about this, could this maybe incentivize more cyber warfare? Say you can get into a Chinese aeronautical base and hack their rockets, hack their satellites. I don't know. I Obviously, I'm not a scientist, if you guys can hear by the words I'm using. But, you know, like, what if it actually leads to escalation on the ground because you can't do anything in space? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. Like someone does something in space, and so instead of retaliating in space, you retaliate on the ground. I mean, obviously, that, I think that is a huge problem, right? Um, as I think, I, I think, the, I think the point I'm trying to make is, as much as we in the past wanted to disconnect space from our day to day or our, our <laughs> on the ground political problems, um, and we signed something in the '60s that was like for the benefit of mankind. The reality is. Almost all of our space exploration was based out of our political leanings, our adversarial competition, right? I think that high that high philosophical idea of space is is nice, but not based in reality. And we have to continue to make sure we monitor and regulate our actions in space, um, but while while also adapting, right? While adapting and allowing private enterprise to use space, I think that's fine if done if done right. Um, but it's, I think it's a super exciting time for space exploration. I think it's a reinvigoration of, you know, more, I think like more kids are into space now than before because of people like Elon Musk and SpaceX and stuff like that. And that's a great thing, but it's just like, we got to be real careful because that idea of us all being happy and nice to each other up there is not based in reality, in my opinion. Absolutely. And I, I really applaud Elon Musk too. He's a weird dude. He has some you know, very cringy moments, but I, I think what he's doing for mankind in general is great. 
Now, let's be honest. Like, I would not get into Jeff Bezos rocket, but I would get into <laughs> Elon Musk rocket. That, that's true, dude. That's true. Fair enough. I mean, I'd, I'd pick <laughs> well, SpaceX over Blue Origin any day. Oh, oh, of course. I mean, you know, the pandemic, Amazon's like skyrocketed and they couldn't even give their employees a pay raise. Uh, I don't really trust that to go into space, man, because do they care about the pilot? I don't know. But but yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm totally for what's happening now. And I think it's really cool. And Elon Musk, I think, is exactly the definition of a, a billionaire. He's he's eccentric. He's a little bit nuts, but he's going to change things. And I'm excited to see it. And I'm also excited to see what other countries put up with, because I hope, optimistically speaking, that maybe cooperation in space will supersede other things because we can't just fire on them momentarily. It could also be quick before we wrap up. It could also be the fact like, you know, we always talk about like economic entanglement is a big deterrent of violence in the global world. Mm -hmm. You could have the same thing with space, right? Like let's say, okay, NASA does a deal with SpaceX, but what if India also does a deal with space? Now that's rare. I don't, I don't, I think that China and India would prefer not to, right? So I'm not, I'm not saying this is a panacea, but I think that it could be interesting that if you had uh, if you had something like asteroid mining and a lot of like economic incentive to be out in space, uh, perhaps allowing public and private mutations to economically entangle one another could could prevent conflict. I mean, you know, if we if we really are like, yeah, China and America are like we, we share an asteroid and we're mining the living crap out of it together and we're we're both contracting <laughs> the same private company to do that so we are entangled. Right? Maybe you could have globalization kind of expand even past the globe in a weird way that could prevent conflict, but you know, flip a coin at this point. I don't know. I, it's an interesting thought. Well, yeah, the the amendment to maybe, you know, how you and I kind of disagreed with the democratic peace theory as time has gone on. Maybe the new peace theory is the Mars peace theory or the comet peace theory. I, I, I think that's a really good point that I never thought about. You're right. I, I think maybe if we see that cooperation and economic entanglement works, eh, what's the point? And India, honestly, to your point, I could see India doing that just because they are in such a kind of like cold conflict with China. Yeah. Eh, who knows? Who knows, man? Yeah. Well, certainly fascinating. Um, you know, I would love to have Neil deGrasse Tyson on to inf uh, cor correct whatever I've said wrong. Um, so shout out, Neil, if you're out there. <laughs> this is a rare chance. Um, <laughs> but no, I, I think it's super fascinating. Um, I do think, again, it's a... I do think we're like entering like a second round of the space age. Uh, you know, it died down a bit in the nineties and two thousands and now we're back, baby. And Elon Musk is taking us to the moon rocket emoji, rocket emoji. So, um, I I'm excited to watch it. I'm super excited to see what happens regarding space. Um, you know, I'm interested to see what Joe Biden's administration does with these private companies. I'm hoping he's willing to work with them. Uh, and I really hope that it does not end up like someone, you know, China, Xi Jinping builds a Death Star. That would be pretty scary. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So I'm, I, I'm actually optimistic. I think, I think you mentioned you are as well, right? Well, well, the good news is if there was a Death Star, the particles from the exploded Earth would destroy the Death Star, according to what Neil deGrasse Tyson was right, saying. Right. right. All those. So, <laughs> so there's at least a good there. But yeah, I am optimistic, man. And you know, let's let's just see what happens. But I. I I had fun talking about this because while we are not scientists, I think we brought up some really interesting points involving like, how do you deal with a conflict in space? that's not physical, you know, stuff like that. How do you, how do you pair private and public corporations? Is that international? Does the U S only let Tesla work with NASA due to confidentiality? There's a lot of questions. And I, I think people like us should be asking those questions. So yeah, it's always fun. Great conversation. Well, let us know what you believe um, or think about this issue. You know, are we about to enter a second space age? Uh, do you think it's a waste of time to even send you know people on the moon to take dirt samples, uh, or is this something that may be worth it down the line? Let us know your thoughts. We want to hear them all. Uh, follow us at the Tonic Accord at Podbean, Twitch, YouTube. Um, Apple Podcasts, and, and stay tuned that we're, we're trying to work with uh, Spotify to get on there as well. So we'll, we'll keep you updated with that. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for tuning into this week's episodes of the Tonic Accord. Um, if you do want to catch us live, it's usually Tuesday evenings, uh, somewhere between 4.30 and 5.30 as we start to go live. Uh, and we'll be streaming live on Twitch and YouTube. And then obviously you can catch the recorded versions later as well. Thank you all again for watching and have a very good week. Ciao.